Hi everybody, Max Lakato here from my home to yours. All the very best to you. All the very best to you. If you're having a bad day, I'm hoping that something is said to encourage you. If you're having a great day, I'm hoping something is said to make a good day even better. We're looking at the book of Romans uh, based in part on a book I wrote some years ago called In the Grip of Grace. Now next week we're going to be beginning our online Bible study based on the book of Romans. And if you'd like to join us, I sure would love for you to do so. You can sign up today. It's free. Uh, there is absolutely no charge. You can connect with other people. You'll have downloadable videos to watch. And uh, I'd, love, I'd love for you to be a part of it. MaxLocato.com is where you can sign up. Let me know how to pray for you. Just post your prayer needs on the prayer page. Three objections to grace is what we're going to talk about over the next seven minutes. Interestingly enough, grace is a difficult truth for some people, many people, to accept. In fact, I think it's easier for people to accept Christ as Lord uh, than it is for people to accept Christ as Savior. It's easier for people to embrace His power than it is for them to accept His mercy. If you've ever struggled with this concept. You're not alone. In fact, apparently the first ones to doubt Paul's presentation of God's great grace were the very first ones to read about it. And in anticipating their thoughts, Paul deals with their objections to God's grace. He deals with these objections head on in Romans chapter chapters 3 and 4. The first objection comes from the pragmatist in Romans 3.31, in which Paul asks, Do we destroy the law by following the way of faith? The concern here is motivation. In other words, if I'm saved by my works, then why work? If I'm not saved by keeping the law, well, then why keep the law if I'm not saved then by what I do, well, why in the world would I do anything? What's to keep us from going crazy? If worship, for example, doesn't save me, why should I worship? If tithing doesn't save me, then why should I give? But Paul counters this question with yet another question. He says, So do you think we should continue sinning so that God will give us even more grace? No. That's Romans 6, 1 and 2. One translator writes, What a ghastly thought. That's the Phillips translation. A ghastly thought indeed. Grace promoting evil, mercy endorsing sin. What a horrible idea. Earlier, Paul tells us that kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. That's in Romans 2 and verse 4. Paul wants us to get it straight. Someone who sees grace as permission to sin has missed grace. Someone who sees grace as permission to sin has missed grace. In another passage, Paul says, Jesus gave himself for us so that he might pay the price to free us from all evil and to make us pure people who belong only to him. People who are always wanting to do good deeds. Titus 2 and verse 14. Grace fosters within us an eagerness to do good. The second objection to grace comes uh, from the overly cautious, the hesitant, those who don't want to hear about anything new. These critics say, now just don't give me any of this newfangled grace stuff, this new teaching. Just give me the law. If it was good enough for Father Abraham, it is good enough for me. Paul addresses these objections and concerns in Romans chapter 4. And he does so by taking us back to Abraham. He says, if Abraham was made right by the things he did, he had reason to brag. But this is not God's view. 
because the scripture says, watch this, Abraham believed God and God accepted Abraham's faith. And that faith made him right with God. Romans 4, 2 and 3. And don't you know these words stunned the first readers, the, the Jewish readers? Paul points to Abraham as a prototype of grace. The Jews upheld Abraham as a man who was blessed because of his obedience, because of his steadfastness. Not the case, argues Paul. The first book in the Bible says that Abraham was made right with God by faith. He believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. That's in Genesis 15 in verse 6. So it was Abraham's faith, not his works, that made him right with God. And of course, Abraham. You know his story. He was far from perfect. I mean, there were times when he trusted the Egyptians before he trusted God. He even lied, telling Pharaoh that his wife was his sister. But he made one decision, Abraham did, that changed his eternal life. He trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. Not my words, the Apostle Paul. Romans 4 and verse 3. The third objection Paul addresses is the skeptic. The skeptic who says, well, grace is just too good to be true. Now, friend, this is by far the most common objection to grace. No one has approached me recently to ask me about Abraham and works and law and faith. But there have been those who have approached me of late to ask me about, have I gone too far? I think about the young woman who spent two university years saying yes to flesh and no to God. I did talk to a young husband who wonders if God could ever forgive an abortion that he funded a decade ago. And then there was the father who's lately realized he's devoted his life to work and neglected his kids. They're wondering. Maybe they're wondering what you're wondering. They're wondering if they've overextended their credit line with God, if they pushed the envelope too many times. But the Apostle Paul answers this objection, and he answers it with yet another example from the life of Abraham. God had promised Abraham and his wife Sarah a child. God even gave Abraham the name, his name, which meant father of many. But 40 years went by. Can you imagine it? 40 years went by and Abraham had no child. Abraham could have done what some of us do and think that God's promise must be, well, just be too good to be true. He could have looked at his 100-year-old body and he could have decided that procreation was hopeless. He could have looked at his mistakes and just assumed that he was reaping the consequence. Childlessness was the consequence, punishment for his mistakes. He, he, he could have looked at his, his gray-haired wife and decided that infertility was inevitable. But Abraham did not. I love the message translation of Romans chapter 4. It says, Abraham believed anyway deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he could not do, but on the basis of what God said he would do. That's why it is said, Abraham was declared fit before God by trusting God to set him right. Friend, God's great grace is not too good to be true. It's good and true. Today, could I encourage you to rest in the grip of God's grace and trust that God's grace is enough to get you home safely. Hey, have a great day. And don't forget who gave it to you.